Welcome to Becoming Bossy. We will answer practice questions to make sure that we are prepared to pass part three of the CIA exam. Today's questions relate to domain one, business acumen, and are specifically a part of the organizational structure and business processes lesson. Question one, the difference between a tall organization structure and a flat organization structure is that in a flat organization structure, A, work is performed in geographically dispersed areas, B, the work is similar and requires little supervision of employees, C, managers generally supervise few employees, or D, has a narrow span of control. So the key word here is that we are focusing on a flat organizational structure. So let's discuss organizational structures right now, which includes both tall and flat organizations. This table highlights the differences between the two types of organizations. In a tall organization structure, there are many levels in the leadership hierarchy. There is a narrow span of control, meaning that each manager has a small amount of employees to supervise. To contrast, in flat organization structures, there are fewer levels in the leadership hierarchy, but a wider span of control. So each manager has to supervise more employees. Flat organizations work well when the work is routine and stable. Tasks do not vary much and they require little supervision and direction from the managers. Information flows quickly from the top of the organization to those lower level employees, such as staff members. So back to the question, given our brief lesson about tall and flat organizational structures, the answer here is that a flat organization's work is similar and requires little management direction of subordinates or employees. Question two, in which of the following stages of the project life cycle would stakeholders be identified? A, execution, B, planning, C, initiating, or D, closeout? So the execution stage includes carrying out the work. That is where the work is actually being implemented and performed. The planning stage includes organizing and planning the project. The closeout stage is when the project is fully completed and all final processes are being performed. Stakeholders generally are identified when the project is being initiated. So the answer here is initiating. Are you still with me? Great. If you're enjoying the practice questions and the lectures, go ahead and subscribe to the channel like this video and comment, I will pass part three, because I truly believe that if you put in the study time that's required, the effort, and if you're disciplined, you can and you will become a certified internal auditor. On to question three, which of the more traditional organizational structures might have issues unless there is open communication between managers to prioritize the work and schedule of employees. Which of the more traditional, that's the key word, organizational structures might have issues unless there is open communication between managers to prioritize the work and schedule of employees? A, cluster, B, hourglass, C, organic, or D, matrix? Like I said, the key word here in this question is traditional. A cluster structure is a non-traditional structure that includes both permanent and temporary teams, which are created based on the organization's stru structure, objectives, and required skills. An hourglass structure is a non-traditional structure that has more higher level executives. Think of an hourglass shape. So there are many higher level executives, such as a CEO, COO, CIO, <laughs> CAO. I mean, there could be a lot of them. And a smaller number of middle management workers. And then back to many lower level employees who are actually on the operational floor, providing the services or making the products. An organic structure is a non-traditional structure that does not require much effort to move employees 
around different reporting lines. An organic structure involves decentralized, not centralized, but decentralized decision-making and has a wide span of control. In matrix structures, an employee may belong to one department or manager, but can also work on another project and report to a separate manager. Open communication between managers, therefore, is key for the matrix structure for work. Question four, which of the following is an advantage of outsourcing non-core business processes to a service entity offshore? Which of the following is an advantage of outsourcing non-core business processes to a service entity offshore? A, no cultural differences. B, no bureaucratic system to deal with. C, loss of internal expertise. Or D, frees up internal resources to devote to core business processes. Here, the keyword is advantage. So think of the benefits of outsourcing to those other companies that will perform non-core business processes, benefits. So let's start off with the definition of outsourcing and what it means. Outsourcing means that a business engages with companies or providers that are external to the organization for knowledge, experience, or services. For example, a business can outsource tax services, legal services, payroll processing, or other services. So let's look at the choices again. We can eliminate choice A because cultural differences can exist when an organization outsources non-core business processes to an offshore service organization in a foreign country. For example, there can be differences in business acumen, customs, even language or communication barriers or differences. When outsourcing by offshoring, government bureaucracy is a potential risk. So we can eliminate that choice as well. There could be certain government laws, regulations, or chains of commands that must be adhered to. This is a risk of outsourcing non-core business processes. Therefore, it is not an advantage of outsourcing. Loss of internal expertise could be a disadvantage or risk of outsourcing because now that certain elements are being handled by another service provider, Employees of the user organization or the organization that is hiring that outsourcer are not experts of that non-core business process that is being outsourced. Looking at D, by freeing up internal resources, the user organization can devote more time to core processes that might lead to a more competitive advantage, which is the answer. Since the non-core processes are outsourced, internal resources, or the employees that are working at that user organization can focus on the core operations and business processes. Question five, which of the following detective controls is used to manage the risk of scope creep during a project? Which of the following detective controls is used to manage the risk of scope creep during a project? A, setting expectations for the project. B, holding status meetings. C, documenting project plans. Or D, doing more than required to complete the project. The key word in this question is detective. There are preventive controls, directive controls, and detective controls. Detective controls in particular are those internal controls that detect or uncover issues problems and deviations from standard processes after they occurred. So detective detects those problems after they occurred. Preventive prevents those issues before they have the chance to occur. So be careful of these keywords in the questions as you're taking your test. Setting expectations for the project is a preventive control to address scope creep. Documenting plans for the project is a preventive control to manage scope creep, so we can eliminate the option. Doing more than what is required to complete a project is, is the very definition of scope creep, so clearly that's not the answer. 
Holding status meetings is a detective control to manage scope creep because managers can check in with staff or project leaders to understand what areas or what scope objectives are being tested, audited, or further developed. If management recognizes that the team is focusing on more than just the initial planned objectives and that scope creep is occurring, then management can step in and remind the project team of the key objectives that were initially set out to be tested, developed, or audited. So this is the answer, holding status meetings. Question six, which of the following is a requirement for a legally binding contract? A, a contract must be written. B, a contract must be notarized. C, consideration is provided by one or more parties or D, a contract is always bilateral. So looking at the choices, again, as you're taking your exam, just be careful of these trick uh, words that are in the choices. So things like always and option D, that should trigger you to say, hey, are contracts really always, do they always have to be bilateral or can they be unilateral or can they have more than more than two parties? So just look at those things like must or always or never. So just a trick as you're taking your exam. Back to the question, there are five requirements needed for a legally binding contract to exist. The requirements are that there must be mutual agreement, which means that all parties involved in the contract must agree to the contract terms. Secondly, consideration must be exchanged which means that something such as money or currency is given up by one or more parties. Number three, all parties are competent and must be competent in order to enter a legally binding contract. They must have the ability to understand contract terms in order for this to be an enforceable and legal contract. Number four, there must be a legal subject matter which means that the agreement must relate to legal products or services. If it relates to illegal subjects, such as the sale of certain illegal substances in certain states, then this would be an unenforceable contract. It would not be legal. It would not be valid in the eyesight of the law. And lastly, there must be a mutual right to remedy. This means that there is an ability to rectify or correct any contract breaches. So if one party does not own up to their parts of the contract, such as they do not provide a service or they do not provide products, then there must be some plan in place for them to correct or fix that issue or that breach of the contract. A legally binding contract may be written or verbal or implied through business practices. So therefore, it does not necessarily have to be written. We can eliminate that choice. Since contracts can be stated or verbal, there is no requirement that they are notarized, so we can also eliminate that option. Contracts can be unilateral, which means that they only have one party that has a responsibility to act, not act, or provide services. They can also have more than two parties, so therefore, that option, that, that bilateral option that says that a contract must always be bilateral is incorrect as well. So given the four choices for a contract to be legal, there must be consideration given by one or more parties. So therefore, the answer is C, consideration is, is provided by one or more parties. If you made it this far, please subscribe to the channel and comment below, I made it. We are on the journey to 1000 subscribers, so be sure to subscribe if you have not done so already. If you have, thank you so much for watching and following the channel. See the description box below to find out ways that you can support the channel even more. I hope this study session helped you learn more about organizational structures and business processes and will help you fly through domain one business acumen questions on part three of the CIA exam. Share this video with others who you know are also studying for part three. If you would like more study sessions like this, make sure that you subscribe and turn on your post notifications for more videos about the CIA exam. As always, stay blessed and stay bossy.